<laughs> All right, no problem. Just act like a rock star. <laughs> Good to see everybody this morning. I'm uh, very much appreciative of being here. And I'm really glad to have been uh, invited. And I just want to speak for a few minutes about uh, some of the radicality of Martin Luther King, how it, how it led up through uh, and to his, his death. On February 12, 1968, Martin Luther King and his staff completed the master plan for what they call the Poor People's Campaign, by which they hoped to mobilize the masses of impoverished Americans of all races and regions to descend upon the nation's capital to, to, quote, place the problems of the poor at the seat of government, unquote, <clears throat> and remain there en masse until the government announced substantial resources and measures to ease the suffering of the millions of poor and near poor Americans. But King also had in mind the longer term goal of forcing those who reigned over America's capitalist political economy to address the structural dimensions of the nation's extreme economic inequality. For, uh, for King had been an, uh, an anti-capitalist with the evolving socialist sensibility since his college days. In a letter to his future wife, Coretta, in 1952 when he was 23 years old, he wrote, I imagine you already know that I am much more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalist. Capitalism started out with a noble and high motive, but like most human systems, it fell victim to the very thing it was revolting against. So today, capitalism has outlived its usefulness. In a 1956 sermon entitled Paul's Letter to American Christians, King preached to his Montgomery, Alabama congregation, his Montgomery Alabama black congregation. Uh, in the imagined epistolary voice of the Apostle Paul, he read, I understand that you have an economic system in America known as capitalism. Through this economic system, you have become the richest nation in the world, and you have built up the greatest system of production that history has ever known. But Americans, they tell me that one-tenth of one percent of the population controls more than 40 percent of the wealth. God never intended for one group of people to live in superfluous, inordinate wealth, while others live in abject, deadening poverty. So I call upon you to bridge the gulf between abject poverty and superfluous wealth. Did this 50 years before Occupy. Perhaps even more telling of the radicality of King's political vision is the estimation of him by C.L.R. James. Reflecting on 1957 afternoon of intense political a discussion with King at his London flat. James asserted that he found King as deeply committed to radically reshaping the architecture of capitalist society as were James and his revolutionary colleagues. Said James, I saw him as a man whose ideas were as advanced as any of us on the left, but he couldn't say such things from the pulpit. And in his final speech to the Christian, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference in August 1967, maybe, six months or so before it was murdered, King said to the gathered ministers, one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. He went on, something is wrong with capitalism. There must be better distribution of wealth, and maybe America must move toward democratic socialism. Call it what you may, call it democracy, or call it democratic socialism but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all of God's children. S saying this to black preachers in 1967. There's probably no other black preacher saying anything vaguely like that. And very few are saying anything like that today. What we need, said King, is nothing less than, quote, a restructuring of the very architecture of American society. In the final analysis, this is what Poor People's Campaign meant to King. But two months after that initial planning session, we know that King was dead, just days before the Poor People's Campaign was to begin. Was this coincidence, or was there something more at work? Not, not a hard question to answer. <clears throat> the World War Adjusted Compensation Act of 1924 granted America's World War I veterans what they call bonus pension certificates. However, the certificates could not be redeemed until 1945. And as the Great Depression deepened, desperate veterans pleaded for early redemption of their, uh, their certificates, but to no avail. In May of 1932, 300 frustrated, desperate 
veterans journeyed to the nation's capital to demand immediate cash payment. Within two months, some 43,000 bonus marchers, as they came to be called, 43,000 had descended on the capital and built more than two dozen camps, the largest with 15,000 people, that they ran with organizational discipline like a bona fide city, digging in for an extended occupation. After a hastily crafted congressional bill that would allow early redemption was defeated, Congress demanded that the marchers campsites be dismantled, but the bulk of the pro protesters refused to leave. President Herbert Hoover called out the army to destroy the camps and forcibly remove the bonus marchers with a full-fledged military action replete with tanks, infantry and cavalry regiments, fixed bayonets, and tear gas. By nightfall, hundreds had been injured. A baby and a 12-year-old boy later died of their injuries. Public outrage that the United States military had declared war on its own citizens, that is, on its, on its own white citizens, uh, forced the federal government, for the first time in US history, to acknowledge that it had a responsibility to care for the welfare of its impoverished citizens, such as it was, uh, impoverished vet veterans, and by ultimate extension, to care for all the nation's poor and vulnerable. With memories of the bonus marches fresh, and only three weeks after taking the presidential oath of office in March 33, Hoover's successor, Franklin Roosevelt, created the Civilian Conservation Corps to provide employment for up to 500,000 workers. This signaled a fundamental shift in government policy from the laissez-faire, hands-off economic uh, policies that ruled the day to policies that were forged with more social needs in mind. And these policies set the stage for the sweeping social reforms that became the New Deal. The actions of the bonus marches resulted in momentous changes in the American political economy and an unprecedented redist redistribution of wealth. Well, planned redistribution of wealth. Despite the fact that the marches only sought pension checks for a small percentage of the American populace, less than 2%. But the Poor People's Campaign had a far broader uh, agenda that was consciously fashioned to appeal to the interests of a much larger constituency, the 28 million or so Americans then living below the poverty line. King saw the campaign, quote, uniting all races under the commonality of hardship in order to forge a new interracial class-based movement of poor people. With King's name recognition, uh, diminished at that point, but still, but still substantial, and the campaign's shared focus on the interests of the tens of millions of struggling Americans, it had the potential to be a truly massive, uh, be truly massive, the most momentous political gathering in American history. If it was able to cast the imaginations of Americans like the March on Washington had, or anything like the March on Washington had, which was fully plausible, given that the morality of its quest was no less compelling, then the future that, then the influence that the campaign's moral authority and sheer numbers could exert on America's political economy could conceivably force real changes in government and immense expense and opportunity costs for industry. Couple this with King's, quote, Queen's radical, quote, visioning, vision of restructuring the architecture of American society, end quote, then the class nature of the poor people's campaign potentially posed perhaps the greatest threat to America's capitalist order that had ever been seen. A successful campaign could have actually empowered the unempowered masses in ways that could cause capitalist nightmares. The policies King sought to force in the near term included a job for every able-bodied worker, unemployment insurance for all workers in every occupation, including domestics and farm workers, uh, a fair minimum wage, guaranteed annual income for all Americans, and educational curricula for impoverished adults and children designed to strengthen their self, their image and self, sense of self-worth. His long-term goals were much more uh, far-reaching, however. The indictments King offered of capitalism and the class inequality that bedeviled American society during his travels to drum up popular support for the campaign very much concerned the members of the capitalist power elite. To one audience, King said, we're dealing, in a sense, with class issues. We're dealing with the problem between the haves and the have-nots. He told the New York Times reporter, in a sense, you could say that we're involved in class struggle. King was no longer t talking civil, civil rights. He was talking systemic change, even structural revolution. He said, 
I think we must see the great distinction here between a reform movement and a revolutionary movement. He made it clear that what he advocated was revolutionary action that would, in his words, quote, raise certain basic questions about the whole society. This means a revolution of values. The whole structure of American life must be changed. For the campaign to have a chance of success, King realized that it was necessary to, quote, forge new tactics which do not depend on government goodwill, but instead serve to compel unwilling authorities to yield to the mandates of justice. He even called the new tactic aggressive nonviolence, aggressive nonviolence. He indicated that he was even willing to engage in nonviolent sabotage to shut down the nation's capital so the needs of the poor would get the full attention of those who held the purse strings and reins of power. The actions of the bonus marchers ultimately caused major changes that significantly altered America's social landscape by re redistributing wealth through New Deal policies. Although discomforting, however, these changes did not threaten capitalism per se. But King's advocacy of forced structural change and full economic democracy portended a significant limitation of capitalist profits, power, and purposes, and posed a threat of such magnitude that for America's capitalists, it had to be stopped. For there was no telling how far the poor people's campaign might go and what it might accomplish. Moreover, King's call for the striking Memphis sanitation workers to engage in a general citywide strike two weeks before his death would have compounded the anxiety of politicians and CEOs that King might call for a national general strike under the banner of the Poor People's Campaign. The prospect of a general strike was extremely daunting to both government and industry because the few non-union general strikes that had occurred in the United States had literally shut down entire cities, costing millions of dollars in lost revenue. But what greatly compounded the government and corporate fear of the Poor People's Campaign was King's public confession of his opposition to the Vietnam War in April 1967, in which he declared that the war and the extreme poverty in America were both the tragic consequences of capitalist greed and exploitation. He decried, quote, individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money, money in Asia, Africa, and South America, who take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the country. Thus, a successful Poor People's Campaign with King at the head also threatened capitalist profiteering on the Vietnam War. Because like the Halliburton Corporation in the Iraq War, much of corporate America was raking in billions of uh, revenue dollars from the Vietnam War. The largest American corporations were more profitable than ever. For instance, in 1966, three of the four largest U.S. firms operating in Vietnam ranked in the top, ranked in the top 10 most profitable of the 400 American firms doing business abroad. The year before that, in their annual report, the Caterpillar Corporation actually directly attributed their record profits to the war. They admitted that aloud in print. That corporate capitalists and elite bankers and lawyers understood the war in terms of the economic interests and new product markets that Vietnam represented is seen in the roster of President Lyndon Johnson's major uh, foreign policy advisors, including some of the most powerful attorneys and corporate heads in America. Johnson's appointees to a Vietnam War propaganda committee even uh, included pre presidents and directors of the largest American multinational banks and directors of the largest American corporations. Thus, the political platform that the Poor People's Campaign could offer King's opposition to the Vietnam War, coupled with the declaration of class, with his declaration of class warfare, gave those invested in maintaining the economic and political status quo more than enough reason to neutralize the great threat that King presented. And that is why Martin Luther King had to die. The powers that be correctly surmised that with King gone, the Poor People's Campaign was doomed to failure and their structures of control maintained. We probably will never know, how con never know conclusively if King's assassination was the product of capitalist fears or the impact uh, on the capitalist of, uh, political economy that a successful Poor People's Campaign posed. Yet we do know that the specter of the economic um, of the economic radicality that Martin Luther King had, <clears throat> that we do know that the specter of the economic radical that Martin Luther King had become, standing at the head of a successful people's campaign of many hundreds of entrenched thousands, 
demanding sweeping restructuring of the political economy pose a threat to the federal government and the capitalist class of potentially enormous magnitude. Thus it might be said that King's speech condemning the Vietnam War wrote his death warrant, and that his determination that America must realize true economic democracy signed the warrant. And if this is so, we can plausibly, plausibly conclude that it was the captains of America's political economy that executed the death warrant of Martin Luther King. Thank you. A few minutes for some questions. Minutes for questions. Questions, or questions and comments? Questions and comments or contradictions. Agreement. <laughs> What's that? Rather agreement. <laughs> Any questions on Yes. I appreciate you providing some specific context to um, Dr. King's statements in his final month because oftentimes there is an anti-capitalist king that has been created and one can feel sometimes like the texture of that creation is um, not weighted in historical evidence or material, you know, material based in the archive. So I definitely appreciated you going back to those speeches and reiterating and bringing out some of his political analysis. So more of a comment than a question. Yeah, you know, teaching a course um, at Columbia called the African-American prophetic political tradition from um, David Walker to, well, Barack Obama. But I mean, we've got to deal with him because he's the first black president, but he certainly was no political prophetic figure. Um, but what's interesting is that the students, black and white, sit there open mouthed at the time and said, well, if they were, if, you know, T. Thomas Fortune had, a Marxist political, a Marxist economic uh, uh, analysis of society in 1880, and we have a black Christian socialist up through the early 20th century, blah, 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 blah. Um, why aren't we hearing anything like that today? Why is there no analysis at all today from any of the figures, most of whom are, I know, know personally, and I, they're okay with me, but they're not giving any analysis at all. And that was the importance of King, and that is the danger of King, looked at. Uh, Correctly, he was a Christian minister, um, and that's important to you know many of the masses of America people. But he also offered a critique and an, and an analysis with a vision of the future. He called it the beloved community, which really was a, a social democratic uh, experiment um, by all all indications. And some of these jokers, they never you never hear them say a word. They don't utter the word capitalism out of their mouths. They don't even come close to it. So King, 50, 60 years later, is still um, on the cutting edge in that terms. In fact, he's still ahead of them uh, even now, which is a damn shame under heaven. I'll leave it on the <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, the thing is, uh, um, you know, uh, Einstein is 2020 vision. But sometimes I guess we're still blind. Um, <laughs> back then, the tension and the struggles that was taking place with King, SCLC, SDS, SNCC, um, all those struggles that were taking place, you would figure that today there's this recurring things that continue over the last 50 years that you say you, in terms of learning from King and his position, and of course he was right in many instances, including the struggle between King and Malcolm and all those. Today you have Black Lives Matter, you have others, and you have the Bernie campaign, you have, S you have uh, DSA and all that. And the struggle continued in relation to tactic between Cornel West and Tanishi Coates and all these questions continue to come up even though I would feel, and many, some would feel that it had been settled. And it was settled back then in terms of with King emerging as the master tactician of the movement then, and that his policy uh, served to be rather fruitful. And yet, you continue to have these reoccurring things. So what lessons have we learned from those struggles to put it into our struggles of today? Well. <laughs> I guess there's always going to be those kinds of 
power struggles. I think that if we look at King, though, what we can learn from him is to be uh, uh, is to keep full focus on uh, on the vision for change, ultimate change, structural change uh, in, in in America. I mean, of course, we, we should have we should be working together and and uh, all of that, but. It's, it's important not to get sidetracked, you know? Mm -hmm. And some of these folk, they just <clears throat> sidetrack you. And, and, and most of these gentlemen, they call black leaders, it's, it's their, their egos are, are, are leading to a, to, to a great extent. So, you know, the other thing is that Malcolm, I mean, that the Martin had a, had a vision that he was in the process of articulating it. He named it, but he was in the process of fully articulating it. And that is really the lesson to be, you know, lesson to, be learned that that is what we should be focusing on as regard um, Cornell and, and Tom Ta um, um I don't even know that I don't even take that seriously because Cornell is my dear friend but I'll you know I can't I can't make any excuses for that except <laughs> ego you know uh, and we need to sort of <laughs> stop that yes sir Hi, my name is uh, Daniel Teko. I was born in the west part of Cameroon. Um, the young people in Cameroon today have copied the lifestyle of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., his legacy, and uh, the standing up and talking about human <laughs> rights in the, um, using rally or getting together as a way to let the government uh, understand their plight. So um, in October 2016, the young people of the west part of Cameroon went to the streets and said, hey, we need the government to put this for us in school. Um, the lawyers went to the streets and said, hey, we want the government to straighten this or that. The teachers went as well. We wanted the government to straighten this and that. But exactly what happened was the same that happened to the time of Martin Luther King Jr., that the police had to beat this, uh, these protesters up locked them up, some of them were shot in live bullets. And uh, after that time, the protest has continued. And for two years now, there has been no school, no court system. Everything is paralyzed. And more than 60,000 refugees have run to Nigeria. And there are also um, a lot of people have been killed by the government of Cameroon. They are simply talking about their basic human rights. So I'm trying to relate this to what happened to the time of Martin Luther King Jr and uh, it's going on in this modern day as I'm talking today. This is what is happening. So the people got so frustrated that they had to like, okay, but how did we get ourselves in this mess in the first place? Mm -hmm. They're getting back to their history to realize that, oh, we joined French Cameroon. We are from the English part. We joined and there's a resolution 1608 at the United Nations that brought in that unity on the 1st of October 1961 that the United Nations is afraid to touch that document. So my question comes back to what we have here today is um, how can our, we in the modern today learn about uh, the Martin Luther King's legacy and apply it to our current situation mm -hmm. to help push, uh, I mean, our okay. the, the okay. modern struggle ahead. Thank I, you. I Thank you. Well, one thing we have to mention, the Martin, the Martin Luther King wore a funeral suits. Um, he was uh, very con conservative in demeanor and uh, most young people weren't at all interested in what he had to say mm -hmm. toward the end. Uh, and then you have Malcolm X. I mean, you know, me and my buddies like, damn, we don't want anything Mar Martin Luther King had to say. You know, they said, I ain't gonna let no white people kick my ass. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and thank him for it. Say I'm gonna love him. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, something that, that's a lesson we, we learned that we have to be able to uh, bridge the gap uh, with with young people in a way that, that they can hear it and catches their imagination. On the other hand, um, Philip Agnew uh, from the Dream Defenders, what did they change his name to? Uh, anyway, from the Dream Defenders down at uh, Florida, you know, as part of the Black Lives Movement, as, um, told me in a conversation that his group is actually studying uh, Martin Luther King, the later Martin Luther King, believe it or not, uh, and st socialism at, at, at the same time. So King does have this kind of this kind of this kind of valence, but um, this whole notion of nonviolence, 
Um, I don't know that it can catch on conceptually today. I mean, in practice, if you, you know, present it in some other kind of way, strategic way or something, I don't know, um, in terms of another kind of resistance, um, it, it, could, it might catch the, the imagination of, of, of the masses of young people. But um, if not, I mean, I think the nonviolence is a non-starter, just like it was for us in the, uh, in, in, in the 60s. Me and my buddies didn't want nothing to do with it. We called Martin Luther King a punk, um, which I regret, Martin. Martin. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, if I could just, I, don't mind, just, uh, just a couple of things. I think um, w one thing that I'm definitely thinking about um, in relationship, uh, I'm sorry, in relationship to this um, this conference, is that there was a, there was another meeting that happened in '68 that I, think, I don't think a lot of people talk about, and that's a meeting that was organized by Freedom Ways Magazine mm -hmm. for the centennial. Of W. E. B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. um, and in that meeting, you know, um, you know, he, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. speaks very out, outspokenly around Du Bois as a communist. He said that you know we have to recognize that Du Bois was a genius that was a communist, mm -hmm. and, I, and and you know, and something that I'm kind of kind of reckoning with is this kind of like historical historical remembrance, or Pacific historical forgetting of anti-communism, McCarthyism within the black community. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I joined, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm outing myself, when I remember when I joined the Young Communist League, the first thing my, my, my father said to me was, oh my God, like, don't do that. You're, they're going to do you like Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. That was in 1992. Mm -hmm. So my dad goes back to the 1950s to talk about this. So I'm wondering, insofar as that we're talking about Martin Luther King, in relationship to this conference, in relationship to historical remembrance, how Pacific ideas around amnesia, nostalgia, McCarthyism, sensibilities can kind of be played into this kind of way in which we tell history in the sense that you're doing it, it too. Yeah, well, I, I, I'll give a short answer. I hope that it's, it's, uh, that's enough. Um, I mean, it, it really is important. The courage of King is, is, is seldom fully understood. I mean, the price he had to pay. For one, one, one thing, he was deathly afraid of, of jails, deathly afraid of jails. He had been pulled out of a jail in Atlanta um, in the middle of the night, thrown in the back seat of a cop car with the German shepherd next to him um, for Oh, 200 miles or so driving the back country. He just knew he was going to be lynched. He just only didn't have, didn't know um, how painful it might be, but he just knew. Imagine two hours, German Shepherd next to you, and you think you're going to your death. It was traumatic. And that's, of course, when uh, John F. Kep that helped John F. Kennedy win in the black folks, because he called Coretta to, to, a, to a, uh, offer his help. But despite that deep pathological fear, the man continued going uh, to jail without complaining. And see, those, those kinds of things are, are very important uh, to point out. But also, everybody was on his ass. You know, when he, uh, he toward the end, he had 72% of Americans after, uh, didn't want anything to do with him after he had been like man of the year just a couple years before, or the most you know, popular uh, American. 55% of black folks didn't want anything. Uh, uh, to do to do with them, and then on on top of that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover and all that. I mean, the man paid a, 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 a horrible, a, a terrible price. But it is inspiring to know that, um, on one hand, um, be, well, because you, you have this nonviolent figure that that one might dismiss, but then we look at his, his courage. He had much more courage um, uh, than others. But also, it points to the fact that. This, you know, one, you know, head Negro leader um, stuff is is very, very dangerous. And um, in fact, you know, there's no one on the scene that I even think we don't need one. But there's no one out there who even comes close. Um, and so we see all we, we see all this with King. He was just after he gave the Vietnam speech, 163 newspapers attacked him within the next day or two. 163, including all the major Negro papers. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of stuff he had to deal with. So you're right, this needs to be un understood. So what does that mean for us? Well, you know, we have to be more strategic about the way that 
the way that we organize, um, and the appeal and, and the constituent appeal that we strategically uh, engender, like to young people, for instance, which he, and he had no protection from them, masses in the street. I, I want to follow up with this one real quick. I hope you don't mind. This, this, this I'll be real quick with this. Um, I'm just kind of thinking, and I kind of kind of alluded this a little bit to Shahid's presentation yesterday, um, a little bit in terms of like the, the idea of the relational. Um, you know, and the Shahid talked about the subjectivity and objectivity. And something that really strikes me as really interesting is the fact that um, it's not just a question of being poor in the United States, but the question of degradation. And, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm wondering to what extent the issue around degradation plays a role in, in, the, in these things that we were talking about in terms of organizing or sensibility in terms of community and things of that nature. Um, you know, because certainly I, I think that, you know, King's like, approach certainly was starting to think through some of these things around connecting poverty to a larger human spirit, correct? Well, yeah, and, uh, and he, 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 did that, he did that relatively you know, early, you know. Um, uh, he talked about, what, in 64, he said his dream had turned into a nightmare. And he talked about, uh, he said, you know, you can't have life in all its dimensions and dignity and all that, and you don't have a full, um, you don't have a, 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 an adequate income. So that was really all, of, and, and that was part of his appeal, I think, because he talked about, uh, I mean, black people as subjects and not objects. And he honored, uh, he honored in black folks in traditional ways that spoke to the masses of black folks, particularly the southern black folks. But you know he he didn't have a universal appeal to black people. Obviously, he did. He did not. He did not. I mean, because in the in the I mean in the north he had less. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no, that was not a joke about it. No, um, well, okay. Well, I, I guess that is so evident. Yeah. But, but what I mean is, it was, his appeal was largely uh, was more regional than than is really. Uh, uh, often thought because he just he didn't he had southern preacher black preacher sensibilities mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. went to segregated schools and all that and that gave him a certain kind of sensibility and I don't mean anything like Oprah talked about you know, <laughs> uh, with her stuff about she's successful because she didn't go to segregated school but he had these uh, black preacher sensibilities Christian sensibilities and it didn't play real well in the urban uh, ur urban areas particularly that folk where folk could sit down and have a hamburger at a, uh, yeah. uh, you know, at, at, at a count, at a cafe. It was well, one one brother. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we can close that thing. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I can. I can uh, mobilize up. This is one last question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. wrap it up. You raise the issue of redistribution uh, when you talk about the GI Bill, and in our society, of course, redistributive policies that are accepted in the mainstream generally come at a time when there's perceived social threat. Uh, yeah, so. uh, sort of uh, during the war, during World War II, debates about the GI Bill precisely went into the questions of look what happened to Italy, look what happened in Germany when they didn't have a robust way to handle the returning veterans. The same debates, of course, occurred during this period of time in the Great Society. And the two questions are, first of all, I remember vividly when King made his speech in uh, April of 67. It took me by surprise because I knew so many people who were from the bottom up criticizing him for not doing this. So the question becomes, if you look at it from this period now, you know, the pros and cons of sort of the bottom up critique, that we're attacking King for not taking his stance. Taking which stance? His stance you? against the war, oh. uh, which, you know, because Snick, you know, we know what happens in 65, 66. And the second thing is the question of how he's remembered the Poor People's Campaign and all that. You know, in the left, of course, it's isolated. It's sort of valorized as the, the last part of King's life is what we have to remember, how he became radicalized. Of course, in the mainstream, it's sanitized. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering how we get beyond this, side, you know, this sort of politics of memory, which you know, really doesn't help us mm -hmm. in the present. Yeah, yeah. Well, the second part question, yeah, it's, um, You know, losing our losing our historical memory about King, uh, 
you know, it, it, we, we, we cast aside an important re resource, right? And um, so there are, you know, some of us who are working hard to try to, you know, to bring King's, uh, his uh, views on political economy um, to the fore and uh, his, his struggle to make structural changes, his commitment to that. And I think that's, I think that's an, important, um, an important service on the one hand, but, but on the other hand, it's like really hard to get people to pay attention to that because this, um, you know, second half of the March on Washington speech, you know, uh, I have a dream is just, just so hegemonic now mm -hmm. that it's so hard to cut through that uh, for, to, to get people to see King, to re recognize him in another light, as you know. Um, and I mean, it's really hard because I've been doing King for quite a while. Let me tell you a quick anecdote. I'm writing a book on King. Um, my first publisher was Harper, Harper Collins. The second was Doubleday. They both said, look, man, you know, come back with a, your next book, come back about 20 pages, we'll be interested in doing. Writing this book on King, this, you know, unsung radicality King is the working title. So I go back to them and first these two come back to me, we love the book, but we can't publish it. Because there's not a market for this kind of, this kind of thing. My agent went to every major and some minor publishers. And my books have done well in the past, but no one would touch this book. Mm. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard thing, but I think it's a real service to offer. And your first point was, question of bottom up, you know, the king, 65, 66, you see about how people snig and everything are pushing the anti-war message. And King is sort of going through these problems with it because he's dealing with Johnson. He's trying, he's, you know, they're trying to get the civil rights legislation passed, but yet from the bottom up, he's getting that critique of the war that's mm -hmm. coming up and he's having to calculate, do I want to take uh -huh. these kind of stands because it will hurt this wider vision I have. And I'm wondering what you say about that because that is something relevant to the present. You know, yeah. the dilemma of a leader taking a stand that may or may not be wise politically, but is wise ethically. Uh, well, does that make sense, if you will? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, King didn't have a problem you know, standing up to Johnson, criticizing Johnson. Um, you know, we, we, we see that he criticized the, this uh, um, part of the great society. I've got the this anti-poverty particular policy. He said it was anemic and too weak. And, uh, you know, I mean, Johnson was like, what is this Negro? He didn't call him a Negro either. <laughs> <laughs> what's, 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 he, what's he saying? And, um, and then, you know, when, he, when he, his Vietnam speech, everybody told him not to do it. Everybody. Stanley Levinson went home and got in bed because he knew what was going to happen after this speech. Everybody told him not to do it. King did it. Did it anyway. So what that says to me is that the reason he hadn't spoken up earlier was he was trying to accomplish accomplish some other other things um, with with uh, with regard to uh, um, the Great Society anti segregation, um, but but also that he was trying to find a way his way to you know, how how would he strategically address this Vietnam. A war a situation, and that's and he finally came to the conclusion that you know I have to put myself out here and take all the slings and arrows. But uh, as I understand, he was always he was working toward that. Um, but it's not like he was waiting below. Uh, you know, not like he was holding back. But he was uh, he was working toward that. And as far as the grassroots and everything, um, I don't know how much support King was having with the, the grassroots anyway at that at that point. I don't know how much dialogue that they were in with, with King at, at that point. I suspect not, you know, not, not a lot, uh, which also speaks to his strategic courage. He went, he did it anyway. And if there's, one of the things we have to take away is we must have political courage and moral courage, which is what we don't see much of today in our mainstream leaders. Very little moral courage. They are moral midges, most, most of them. <laughs> it's a damn shame. And they're getting rich. They're getting, <laughs> now I'm better stop. Now I'm getting too clear, too clearly personal. And you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, 
Um, that's my comment on that. I close with that. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, one moves right to the next panel.